Friends, good morning and welcome to our sunrise service on this Halloween Sunday, uh, October 31st. And I am a bit disappointed this morning. I was really, really hoping, because today is the last day of our pumpkin patch, I was really hoping to be back out in the pumpkin patch for one more, one more service, but uh, it's a bit damp uh, out there, wet and uh, chilly, but chilly's okay. But uh, I am, again, thankful for this space, this place, and it is comfortable in here next to the fire. So uh, we will take it today. But uh, yes, today is Halloween, uh, or Sahuin in uh, the Celtic tradition. And uh, we might hear a little bit about that, but it is also Reformation Sunday. And um, it, it, for whatever reason, in, in the life of the Methodist Church, even as I remember growing up, didn't get a lot of play. It didn't get a lot of of, um, of mention, but uh, I think it's pretty important in in the the especially the three major tenets of the Re uh, the Reformation uh, as it related to Martin Luther, who was the most prominent reformer um, of this Reformation period. Now, in in the Reformation itself, that you know that wasn't just limited to Martin Luther. There were so many other reformers. Uh, around and throughout, especially throughout Europe, um, that didn't get as much or didn't gain as much popularity, I guess. But so that's what we're going to look at today a little bit in our time together this morning. So I am glad you were with us this morning, whether you're here right now or whether you will jump on and check it out a little bit later. Um, I'm glad and I'm happy to have you with us. And I'm just, again, thankful for this time together. Um, but today, as I said, is Reformation Sunday, and we're going we're gonna to cover the scripture, scriptural foundation for those three major tenets of, especially Martin Luther's Reformation. But um, as a history major, I wanted to make sure I mention it ver at the very least some of the other major reformers. Um, the, the major reformer uh, out of Switzerland, his name was Heinrich Zwingli, and um, he, although... Um, shared a lot in common with Martin Luther. They disagreed and, and, and remained separated on certain areas of doctrine and, and theology, what their beliefs were, along with John Calvin. And many of you may have heard of John Calvin and, and the Presbyterian movement and some of the Baptist movements. <clears throat> and again, shared a lot of the same tenets, um, especially these three major tenets, uh, were shared among Calvin and Zwingli. And one other, um, he was bohemian, uh, didn't get a lot of, gain a lot of popularity, but his story is just phenomenal. Uh, his name was Jan Hus. And um, when I was in seminary, I was in school and studying, uh, I just really picked up on him and, and kind of got fascinated with his story. He too, like Luther, Calvin, and, and, and Zwingli, uh, knew that there were issues, major issues in, in politics and religion with the universal church at the time, the Catholic church, if you will, and um, was, was railing against those things. And some of the th same things, you know, that Luther and Calvin and Zwingli were, were going against as well. But um, for, for his part in it, uh, Jan Hus ended up being burnt at the stake. He was declared a heretic by those in charge, uh, and he was um, ostracized or excommunicated from the church, which he was fine with that <laughs> because of, of his beliefs now with the, you know, with the, the corrupt nature of, of the church, especially even in that part of the world. So, um, but he continued to preach against it. He continued to, um, to gather others in support against these practices, and some, one of which I, wanna, I certainly want to talk to you about this morning. Uh, but uh, he was labeled a heretic uh, and eventually arrested and burnt at the stake uh, to, uh, and, and thinking, and, and those in power at the time, uh, even the Pope, that there were, see, at that point in time, it was a weird, weird space or place. There were actually three different Popes at the time. It was just a mess. Everything was kind of in turmoil. Um, but then we, we get back to Martin Luther. Uh, and on October 31st, 1517, is when he began um, his official declaration, if you will, of the corrupt nature of the Catholic Church at the time. And for him, the, the, uh, the straw that broke the camel's back, so to say, uh, was the sale of indulgences. 
and indulgences um, kind of still exist in a lot of ways today, uh, but uh, not like they did when, when Luther railed against them and, and preached against them and, and spoke out against them vehemently. Um, so much so that at a, a council called the Diet of Worms is when he was convicted basically of heresy uh, and, for, uh, and he was excommunicated from the church. Um, but he nailed 95 theses or 95 statements against the corrupt nature and policies and practices of the Catholic Church at the time. Uh, on the the door of Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany, where he was a pastor, he was an ordained priest, you know, and um, but he just couldn't bear the the corrupt nature of of the church at the time. It had ceased to become a church, and it be, had to become a business. And and for him, that was just untenable. He he could not tolerate that at all, <coughs> because of his deep rooted faith. And, and true belief in, in three major things that, that went against the teachings of the church at the time. So even though he was an ordained priest, um, he, he didn't hold to many of the practices. And, 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 and once he was taught them, once they were in practice and he had learned them, and, and then studying and reading the Bible, which one of the practices of the church at the time was that uh, the, the lay people were shouldn't have access to it only through the priests. Uh, they should be, you know, fed the scripture, given the scriptures, and have it explained to them. Uh, they should not, and they were discouraged from ever reading it on their own. So, and Martin Luther said that's just wrong. That is not the way it was intended. So. Uh, he, he nailed these 95 statements to the door of Castle Church in Wittenberg, and that literally began the, the major uh, reformation, if you will, and the split uh, from the Catholic Church by so many different sects at the time um, that became different denominations all within the Protestant banner or under the Protestant umbrella. And that's how it was labeled. It was a Protestant movement. It was a protest against the practices of the Catholic Church at the time. Uh, and these were launched by, by, by folk like Zwingli and Calvin and Huss and certainly Martin Luther. But these three things that kind of bound them all together. And there was a time that um, I know at the very least Luther, Calvin, and Zwingli had a, a, a council of their own, if you will. They gathered together to work out as much unity as they could. Uh, and they were fairly successful. Um, however, it, it was not a total success and there was not total unity between those three at all. <clears throat> on some fairly major doctrinal and theological issues. And, and hence, we have now the, the, the Lutheran Church, we have the Presbyterian Church, the Baptist Church, um, and the Reformed Church. So all, all because of um, the, the, the nature of their, their agreement and disagreement. Uh, now, we, those of us that are United Methodists, um, are, are not... That is not directly our spiritual heritage. <laughs> our direct lineage, our spiritual lineage, if you will, is, is linked to the Anglican Church or the Church of England, uh, which is another Protestant denomination um, that split from the Catholic Church, but for very different reasons. Uh, it was the, the Anglican Church or the Church of England was created by King Henry VIII uh, because simply because, or pretty much because, the, the Pope at the time, one of the Popes, would not annul his marriage. <laughs> so he said, fine, I'm not going to be a part of this anymore. I'm going to start my own church. Uh, and he became literally became the head of the, the Church of England. Uh, and that is where, that's where our spiritual heritage uh, is linked to. However, we hold these tenets with Martin Luther, certainly. And the tenets, the three major tenets, as in, in Luther's language, sola scriptura, sola fide, and the priesthood of all believers. Sola scriptura simply means the word of God is 
everything and anything that we ever will need for our, our spiritual journey. And because of Martin Luther's belief in the priesthood of all believers that we'll, we'll talk about in a minute, that everyone, every believer needs to have, not should, but needs to have access to the word of God in their own language. That was his big thing. So it was also with John Wesley, um, the founder of Methodism, that even in the Anglican services, you know, um, as well as the Catholic masses, they were all done in Latin. And the, the, the laity, the general population, didn't really know, read, or speak Latin. Um, they spoke their own language. They spoke German. They spoke, uh, you know, uh, all these other languages around the world. But all the masses were done in, in Latin. And, and that was done in, in a lot of ways to keep folk from understanding or having their own understanding of Scripture and its meaning for them. So Scripture's meaning for anyone and everyone was given to them uh, by the priests. And Luther said, that's just wrong. So his belief in that sola scriptura, or, or by the book alone, um, there is one book for all of us. And there is one faith for all of us. Uh, and we get that in that sola fide, one faith. Um, and it is by faith we are saved, not by works, not by anything that we've done. And then Luther believed in the priesthood of all believers that there was no need for an intermediary between God and the people. So, and I want to share the backing for that. Um, when it comes to the word and the word for everyone, um, you know, we go to 2 Timothy. This is the, Apostles Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul's final charge to his, his protege, his pastor in training, if you will, Timothy. And he says this in um, 2 Timothy 3, verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that those of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Um, and that was, that was Luther's foundation. You know, he said that, that this practice of keeping people out of the book is just wrong. That is not what God intended, not what Jesus taught. Um, this was a, a, a man-made thing, if you will, uh, that masses are done. The, the only word they get is in Latin. And if you can't understand it, you know, it may sound beautiful, but if it doesn't mean anything, if you can't understand it, it you don't get anything out of it, you know. Um, I remember the first time I went to a non-English speaking service. It was a beautiful service. The language was lovely. The songs were beautiful. I knew the tunes, uh, but I didn't understand. I didn't know the language. So it wasn't as meaningful to me. It was beautiful, uh, but it wasn't as meaningful. <clears throat> and unless and until we have that relationship with the word of God, which is what Luther, you know, contended, that people need access to it. And just as Timothy did, uh, and Paul knew that, understood that. Jesus knew that and understood that. Um, so that was Luther's big thing, you know, and in the printing of, of scripture, not in Latin. Uh, you know, the Gutenberg uh, Press in uh, what, 1500 was the first Bible printed in, or the first set of scriptures printed in English, or, you know, or in, not in English, but well, in English eventually, but in German, anything not in Latin. So um, the, the, that notion that we need to be, have access to the scripture, uh, and that all scripture, as, as you know, Luther believes, certainly as, as we should, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful and necessary for everything we need. It contains, the, the Bible contains everything we need to know for our salvation. Um, so that was Luther's foundation. Uh, and along with that um, was his premise or his, his belief in sola fide, by faith alone. And we get that from another very familiar passage from, whoops, 
lost my bookmark here. <laughs> a very familiar passage from Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. And here's what that says. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Um, friends, in other words, what this simply says is that um, we are saved by faith. Through, uh, we are saved by grace through faith alone. Um, that there is no amount of work we can do to wash away our sins. There's no amount of work we can do to buy our way or work our way into heaven. That was done for us by the work of Christ on the cross. And that is it. <laughs> there is nothing other than that. Uh, we were created to do good works, as we talked about a few weeks ago when we were in the book of James, uh, which is why, again, you know, as a side note, Martin Luther uh, called James a straw gospel or a straw book. He didn't like it because of its, his seeming emphasis on, on good works uh, and, and the, the confusion created around that, thinking that you could do good works and get into heaven. Um, but that was not the case. Luther knew that, and we know that. We understand that. And that is what Paul understood as well. Uh, and he brings that out to the church in Ephesus when he says it is by grace we are saved through our faith. When we make that declaration of Christ as our Lord and Savior, when we acknowledge Jesus to be the one and only Son of God, uh, it is in, in that moment, you know, that we are saved by grace. Um, and, and as I read this again, even yesterday and last night, um, I, I, I get to singing in my head um, that song by uh, the, um, uh, the Gaithers. And it's simply called Sinner Saved by Grace. Um, and that's who we are. That's what we are. And in that is what Luther was saying, that it is by faith we are saved. That's where the indulgences come in. Uh, and that was Luther's just vehement anger <laughs> over this practice. And indulgence was the, 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 put simply, was that you could go to a priest or a bishop or an archbishop or even all the way to the Pope, depending on who you were, how much money you had, what kind of influence you had. <clears throat> and you could buy uh, this indulgence. And in turn, you would receive either for yourself, a family member, or even an ancestor that they or you would then receive less punishment before you could get to heaven. You would have your sins washed away by buying this paper. And the people were... were, were taught that, that this indulgence, because of the power of the priesthood, um, that they controlled your access to God. They controlled your access to heaven. Uh, and that deals with the doctrine of, of purgatory. <clears throat> and if you're not familiar, purgatory was basically a holding pen where you, you, you didn't go, when you died, you didn't go right to heaven or you didn't go right to hell. Uh, you, you were in this holding area where you, you would then be subjected to the punishment that was due you for the sins you had committed on earth. And, and when you had completed that time of punishment, then, if judged, you could go to heaven. That is just completely contrary to everything Scripture says. And Luther understood that deeply. And he was hurt by that. He was angered by that. So that when these people bought indulgences, they were literally buying their loved ones or even themselves out of this punishment. It was kind of like a get out of jail free card. You know, and, and when you say it like that, it does sound kind of silly. And it really, I mean, the practice of it, though, you know, continued for a long time. I think, well, uh, 
I guess about 50 years after Luther started this Reformation, it was around, and, and I think it was Pope Urban um, in, in like 15, uh, 1567 that, that kind of banned the practice officially, but unofficially it continued because it was a good fundraiser, you know, for the church. It was a moneymaker. I mean, people built buildings and built churches with money to get themselves and their loved ones out of purgatory. So Luther was just incensed by that. Uh, he said, no, that's just wrong. We are saved by grace through faith. Not by any piece of paper, not by any admonition by anyone else. And which brings him to that third tenet, the priesthood of all believers. Um, and that comes to us, you know, from, again, from the scripture. Um, make sure I get the right verses here. I always get confused. But it's... Um, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. And this is what, you know, this is what um, Peter had to say. So as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And we are, friends, that priesthood of believers. Um, when we look at the simple, the, the functions of, of a priest uh, would be to offer sacrifices on our behalf, uh, as an, acting as an intermediary to God. Uh, and what that says, though, that theology, that belief says that we don't have access to God. Well, there's one image that comes to mind that says, yes, we do. And it happened the day Christ gave himself up on the cross. That in that moment that Christ died, when Christ gave up his spirit, there was a great earthquake and the veil in the temple, that separation between the holy of holies or where God lived and the people was torn. And there was no longer that division. So the, the idea and the belief of that intermediary need uh, was gone that very moment. Um, you know, and there is a role, certainly as shepherds for priests and for pastors, but everyone, as, as Luther said, has, has and needs access to the word of God in their own language. Uh, and everyone has access to God because we are all, a, we are a priesthood of believers. We are bound together in that community to pray to God for ourselves, to pray to God directly for each other. Uh, and that's, that's what we are required to do. That is what we are challenged to do. Uh, not that we have to take it to a pastor or a priest to do. There is a place and a time for pastors and priests to lead corporate prayer, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and even to lead individual prayer uh, in, in our teaching and our leading and our guiding and our directing. But there is no way that I am an intermediary or even a roadblock to anyone and their access to God or their access to the word of God. In fact, in, in certainly in the Protestant faith, it is encouraged. Um, you know, I've lost track of the amount of Bibles that I have purchased to give to people. <laughs> <clears throat> because we want you in the word because it is necessary. And Luther believed that with all he had, with all his being, enough to put his, literally put his life on the line for it. So that is why, to me, friends, Reformation Sunday is an important Sunday. Uh, even though we don't share any direct spiritual DNA with Luther or Calvin or Zwingli, um, we certainly share in that spiritual bond uh, and that belief that we are sinners saved by grace through faith alone, not by works. There is no way we can buy our way into heaven. There is no way that we have to worry about uh, meeting our punishment or, or, or lessening our punishment for our sins because Jesus has done that. Now, you know, again, that doesn't mean that we are just free to go willy-nilly, uh, <laughs> you know, that but our bent to sinning is different when we claim Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And when we do mess up, 
uh, it, 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 it stings and we, we realize we've messed up and then we go again uh, and ask for forgiveness. We don't have to go to an intermediary um, to do that. And, and I thank God for that. So, um, sola fide, by faith alone we are saved by grace. Sola scriptura, the word alone, the word of God is necessary for everyone in a language that they understand. And finally, friends, that priesthood of all believers, that we are bound together as a spiritual house, a spiritual community, constantly building each other up, learning from each other, teaching each other, loving each other. And it's in that love that we honor the greatest command that Jesus gave. Love one another as I have loved you. And by that love, all will know you are my disciples. And that's what it boils down to. And again, it's appropriate for this season of the year as we, we look at new things and new ways of doing things for the coming year, as we envision and prepare for a season of, of, of anticipation and celebration in Advent and Christmas. Um, you know, we kind of launch it again today, even on this Halloween Sunday <clears throat> or All Hallows Eve, because tomorrow is All Saints Day. Um, and a day in which next Sunday in worship and even in this time together at our sunrise, we will honor and celebrate the lives of the saints, those who have gone before us uh, to prepare the way and to, to allow us to experience what we experience today. But today is that All Hallows Eve with its customs and traditions and uh, trick-or-treating and everything else. And, and if you get a chance, if you haven't, read on the, the history of that. It originated in, in the Celtic custom or tradition of Samhain. Um, and uh, that tradition of honoring and, and, and trying to ward off uh, you know, evil spirits and the ghosts because they believed that that was a time that, that All Hallows Eve between, you know, it was this, this line of, line between life and death uh, was, was blurred and that, that the spirits would return to earth and had free range, you know, back and forth for a period of time. So they had, they lit bonfires and they ate and they, and they would go door to door uh, collecting food or, 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 you know, begging for food really <clears throat> because they, they, were looking for protection, they were looking for guidance, they were looking for something to get them through harsh, harsh winters, where winter was, was cold, it was dark in those days, 2,000 years ago, you know. Um, and it was a stressful time, winter. Many people died uh, during these winters. So uh, that day, though, they would honor the lives of those who had, who had gone, who had died. Um, but their traditions, and out of that Celtic tradition sprung up what we now know after so many evolutions of it, if you will, uh, the, the tradition of Halloween or All Hallows Eve um, or La Dia de los Muertes, the Day of the Dead in, in Latin American countries. Uh, but we will, that is tomorrow, November 1st, but we will celebrate it and honor that in worship uh, next Sunday. So, but today again, Reformation Day, a day that we honor and remember um, the work of not just Luther, but others that we've mentioned uh, in standing up for what was just a heinous, heinous time in the life of, of the, the universal church at the time, um, just completely against what, what, what the scripture teaches, completely against the love of Christ for each other, uh, completely against what we know to be right and true. And, and that's why, you know, Paul admonished Timothy, Remember what you've learned. You know, the scripture is yours. This, this, what you know, what you've been taught is yours. You've been, you've had it. You, you, you live by it. You live through it and you will continue to do that. And so will we. So again, friends, we go back to, you know, John Wesley's um, three rules. Do no harm, do good and stay in love with God. And one of those ways to stay in love with God is to stay in the word and to stay in worship, to stay bound together together. Um, by that cord of love that binds us all together, doing the right thing at the right time. So with that, I thank you for being with us and uh, sharing in this time. And hopefully maybe we've learned a little bit of something today. I always pick up a couple things that I didn't remember, didn't know, 
when I get to do some research around Reformation and, and even Halloween for that matter. So that's fun. I enjoy it. And I've enjoyed sharing it with you this morning. And friends, let's pray. Whoop. Crystal Court, uh, <coughs> oh, yes. Pray that everything works out Thursday for our family to be back together. Yes, amen. Certainly will, Crystal. So, friends, let's pray together. Almighty and gracious God, we thank you today as we honor and celebrate the courage and the determination of folk like Luther and Zwingli and Calvin and Hus and others throughout history, Lord, who have helped maintain what is right, what is true, and what is good against what may even be more powerful. So Lord, we honor them this morning and this reformation, this necessary change that was made. So Lord, we thank you for them and their courage. Help us, Lord, to honor them as we continue to have the courage to speak out against the things that we know are wrong, to lift others up when they are being oppressed, when we see and, and when we experience times of injustice and oppression, whatever they may be and wherever they may be. So Lord, help us to always love each other the way you have loved us. So for that courage, for that strength, for that engagement, we thank you for every opportunity that you give us to do right, to do good, to do what is true. So Lord, keep us in your word, keep us in worship, keep us bound together and strengthened by and through one another in all that we do. And Lord, it's in that strength and love that we lift up Crystal today, especially, Lord, <clears throat> as she awaits a determination on Thursday that, um, Lord, we just pray for her and the family for that reunification, for healing to take place where it is necessary, both physically, emotionally, and spiritually, Lord. So we just ask your blessing on, on Crystal and the family today, uh, especially. And for all those, Lord, who are struggling this day, we pray for all those, Lord, who have entered into a season of grief in this time. Lord, be with them. Let your presence go through this journey with them. Let them feel it and experience your spirit through the love and ministry of others around them. And Lord, it is in that love that we lift all these things to you. In your precious and powerful name we pray, amen. Ah, friends, well, thank you again. And as the day and the weather improves, um, wherever your day takes you. And today, if you're not doing anything, uh, the pumpkin patch is in its last day of sales. From two to five, we will have our trunk or treat. Come on out and, and uh, if nothing else, to see how crazy PK gets today. So uh, <laughs> hope to maybe see you this afternoon. But until then, wherever the journey takes you, if you still need to, wear a mask, even get your booster. And I almost did it today. He got me today a little bit. But uh, I have, uh, I have a di di distraction uh, that tries it. every week. It hasn't got me yet. He almost did today. But until then, friends, be safe and wash your hands. God bless.